So I'm not going to hold out on the punchline. The punchline of my talk is this is a total misnomer. Um, as far as you c I can tell, no one has really got irregular time series whipped yet. Um, so you can leave now if you're hoping for a magical solution. I don't especially like talks that promise you something and don't deliver. I have done that. So I won't take it personally if you head out now. Um, but I do think it's an issue that needs to be talked about more. And I'm sort of personally hoping if I talk about it, people will think it's important. And someone who actually uh, you know, knows a fair amount of statistics will do more than I can with this subject. OK, so here's our outline. First thing, why you already care. And if you don't care, why you really should care. Um, where aren't irregular time series in human behavior to start with? Um, I actually work at a startup called OneDrop. We are a diabetes management platform. We are trying to integrate all data about anything that could possibly be related to someone's diabetes and start making smart decisions for them and giving them smart recommendations. So I can tell you that we look at tons of irregular time series. Anything that involves human reporting is going to be irregular. It depends on people's mood. It depends if they were carrying their phone. Um, for people with diabetes, they actually sometimes wear implants that monitor their blood glucose levels. And you think, great, I actually have some regularly sampled data every five minutes. Well, no, not really, because they take the devices off. Um, they get uncomfortable. They need to be recalibrated. They run out of battery. So even when you think you've got a human who's you know, got a tracking device on, just like a wild animal, no, it's never going to happen. So that's health reporting. Um, those of you who work in financial markets, um, the example I'm fairly familiar with, especially is FX. These are irregular, right? I mean, we plot them, and we talk about this data coming through in microseconds across the Atlantic, New York, London, and back. But actually, it's irregular, right? It doesn't come at evenly spaced intervals. It depends when people are buying and selling. And even computers are not doing that on a regular schedule if they're smart. Um, and then another one, parliamentary election cycles. Now, in the US, actually, we do have a regular time series for our elections, but you Europeans um, are more fond of occasionally holding these sudden elections, and so you make yourself a new problem as far as uh, updating your political data. So anywhere you have an underlying, continuous, ongoing truth, but irregular measurements of that truth, you've got an irregular time series, right? Anything where I'm just not measuring on a grid. It's really hard, by the way, to get any human responses, let alone temporarily regular responses. So those of you who don't work with data that you have to sort of drag out of your human subjects, which I totally get, not criticizing them. Um, here's a great example. So some of you might have heard about this in 2015, this major paper in science that was studying um, how discussion impacts people's attitudes about gay marriage turned out to be totally fake. And the way we found out it was totally fake, we, the community, not me in particular, were that researchers were trying to continue, like, wow, this is awesome. Like, they got these amazing response rates. Like, how can we do this? They start sampling, and they get, like, 10% of the response rate. And people started asking what's going on. So that's an example um, of especially anything related to people. You're always going to have a hard time. But you are also always going to have time, even if you're a natural scientist. So if you went into the natural sciences, because you don't like irregularity, because you think people are kind of annoying and hard to study, which is true, you still have problems, right? So I know we've got a bunch of astronomers here. They can tell you far better than I that they have got problems, too, with missing data when they're trying to take regular time series. There's technical failures, right? Anyone who's worked with hardware knows once in a while something blows up. It got overheated. It just got old. It wasn't happy. Um, if you're looking at ground-based telescopes, you've got weather issues. It was just cloudy. There was a hurricane. Um, you've also got things that are just sort of intrinsic, like from where we are to see this interesting galaxy. I have three other galaxies in between, right? That's just not going to go away. Um, this is also relevant to the climate study and paleoclimate proxy data. In particular, you're trying to find rocks or ice that have isotopes you can use to date. This is how we figure out how much carbon there was in the atmosphere at a particular time. Um, these are hard to find. Uh, so the example I'm showing here, I'll talk a bit about later. It's trying to look at the Asian monsoon season and how it has changed over the last you know, couple of millennia. It's not that easy to find the rocks you want in random caves in you know, various countries. So you take what you can get. Um, and similarly, biology experiments. Here, especially uh, more in laboratory experiments, 
We still know those of us who have been graduate students, we don't actually want to be in the lab 24 hours a day taking a regular series. Um, so I know when I was a graduate student, sometimes I wonder if I was even studying my own behavior a bit and not just the system. Because intrinsically, it's like, well, when did I measure it? Right? So um, in a lot of biology experiments, if there is something a human had to do, it's not going to be on a regular schedule. So for exogenous and endogenous reasons, the natural sciences will always face irregularities of measurement, just like the human sciences. You will have more data, but you will have the same problem. So this is all me saying, statisticians get on it. We need some better methods, and here's why. So why should you worry in the meantime? Why can't you just sort of hope for the best or ignore the problem? Well, one reason I've already shown you. This problem is everywhere. And the more sensors we have, the more data we're collecting, the more big data we're doing, the more things will get irregular, right? Because we have a finer granularity of measurement. Maybe irregularity we didn't see before now emerges, right? For example, the census. In the US, we do it every 10 years. I want to think of it as regular, but it isn't really, right? Maybe it was moved up a few months. Maybe it was moved back a few months. So even when you think you've got periodic data, I'd question that. So what should you do? Well, you might start with Wikipedia, right? Oh, this is an area I haven't dealt with. Let me go find those five packages that everyone uses and run through those. If you do this with unevenly spaced time series, this is what you will find on Wiki. To put this in perspective, look at The Simpsons. Um, one I wasn't sure was entirely appropriate, so I left it out. Kim Kardashian actually has an even better Wiki page than The Simpsons. Um, so they both strictly dominate time series or irregular time series. Time series has a very nice Wiki page. Um, so the existing solutions, there are actually more. I do feel if anyone wants to work on the Wiki page, it could use some updating. Um, but here are the less common strategies from what I have seen. One is you can look at each non-gapped bit of the series. So this might work especially, say, for those astro people who most of the time, they are taking regular measurements. And then the cloud comes or, you know, the exoplanet drifts away. They have to wait a while. And then they get another regular series. If you've got enough data, great. And there's very easy ways to do this, especially with Pandas and NumPy. You can sort of break up those chunks and turn them into separate data points. You can also do feature analysis rather than temporal analysis, right? Sometimes, even though you have a time series, it's not appropriate to think of that way, right? Let's say you're actually studying something that is cyclical, and you're not really expecting to see temporal behavior. Um, so an interesting example of this yesterday, for those who went to the mobile activity, talk. Um, we talked a bit about how actually you wouldn't want to think of it as a time series, right? I'm just walking. I really want to study the process of walking, not so much like the time of walking. More common, um, you can resample and then sort of carry on and close your eyes and hope the problem will go away. People do this. I don't mean to talk about this in a disparaging way at all. It actually works pretty well pretty often. So resampling just means you say, I'm going to sort of drop some of my data and make it into a regular time series so that the assumptions I need to be true are true, somewhat artificially. Um, what's sad about that is that I lose data, right? I'm literally, I just struggle to get my data, especially for things where it's really hard to come by enough. And I'm going to throw some of it away. So that's a little bit sad. Some people are very sad about losing their data, so they impute their data. What do they do? They say, I don't want to lose data. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of add data. I'm going to do some sort of linear or Gaussian interpolation and sort of imagine what that missing data will look like. This too, I don't mean to disparage it. It is done very often, most of the time very successfully, and it's sort of the best we've got for the moment in many cases. But I'm kind of interested in doing something sensible without imputing or losing data. Can we use everything we have but not add things? So that's what I'm going to be talking about. Before I do, though, I do want to just highlight some pitfalls of imputing data. Every method has pitfalls. Um, this is no different. One of them um, is sometimes when you try to patch, right, either with interpolation or maybe you just stick your chunks together and ignore the fact that you're missing some, you can have frequency shifts. So especially if you're looking to find out if there's some sort of periodic element to your data, you want to be aware of this. You might be able to say, yes, there is some periodic behavior. But what you won't want to do is quote that actual magnitude, because chances are you're not correct, and you're incorrect in a biased way. Right? It will always shift up. It won't sort of be spread in a random way. Similarly, when you randomly time sample, um, random time sampling, right, which is when you take those subsequences, 
you basically add white noise. Again, not the end of the world, but especially if you have a very low signal to noise ratio, you want to think twice about this, right? Because, uh, for example, in the talk we just saw, sometimes you have error and result, same order of magnitude, right? If you already have that problem, and then you're going to add more white noise, you're really going to be left without any signal at all. So again, very context dependent. Pitfalls in general, even for the methods I'll be showing you soon, error varies with skewness of the distribution of the gaps. So when you look at your time series, you don't just think about what you know. You have to think about how the data was missing, right? Was it truly random? Random how, right? There's different ways to be random. Was it a gamma distribution? Was it a normal distribution? What was it exactly? Look at the skewness of those gaps. So here, in a, a really a landmark paper from 2011, I think the first paper that had seriously looked at the errors in these processes in a long time from geophysicists, because this problem bothers them a lot, we see that the skewness of the distribution of the times that are missing really impacts how these methods do and really differentiates them. So if we look at this top graph, we can see that the Gaussian kernel, that's the yellow, has the lowest error with the highest skewness. It seems fairly robust. These other methods sort of crumble. But it depends on your distribution, right? So this is the same measurement. I think it was um, the, auto, the autocorrelation function, your estimation. We can see now that the blue is also not so bad at a high skewness. That's linear interpolation. So what kind of underlying time series you have, if you even know, will also impact what method you should choose and how much trust you should place in that method. And in some circumstances, a particular method can be really disastrous. So here you are seeing those giant red error bars. That's the loam scargle method, which I'm actually going to be talking about today. But you do need to be aware, in some cases, especially cases that violate the underlying assumptions, you can go very wrong. So you need to know your data before you start your analysis. We all know this, but the truth is we all sort of cut corners. If we got a sensible result, we don't worry so much about backtracking and did it make sense. That's fine most of the time. I don't know if I want my doctor or my airline pilot making a decision that way, but maybe for more exploratory data analysis, it's OK. What do you need to worry about? Skewness in the distribution of your missing time, right? Is it some sort of normally distributed, nice symmetric function or not? Um, how much of it is missing also is very important. So some methods are quite robust, even to a lot of missing data. Others are very, very good. But as soon as you get over some threshold, maybe 15% of the data missing, it's not going to do so well. And it sort of collapses all of a sudden very disastrously. So this is an area where you want to run your own tests on sort of, I don't want to say fake, but simulated time series that you think you're dealing with before you decide. You also want to know what kind of noise you have. The kind of noise you have will impact how these methods do as well. For those of you who are not familiar with different colors of noise, we're looking at a power spectral density. You might think of these as Fourier transforms. Um, often we assume we're working with white noise, which means your noise sort of comes in at all frequencies. Um, I used to work at a physics lab. I never saw white noise in my entire life. Everything was 1 over f, which is pink noise. Um, in other areas like human audiology, you're looking at red noise. So something to be aware of as well. OK, so now we have gotten past all the bad news. And I want to look at some periodic data, right? I've got an irregular time series, but I have pretty good reason to believe it's periodic. So here's an example of this. Anyone know what this is? It's also labeled as an RR Lyrae. It is a very regular star. It sort of blinks on and off. It has the same brightness wherever it is in the universe. So astronomers use this to gauge distance. So for them, when they're trying to identify these things, they're really looking for this pattern. But you can see even they have missing data, like we talked about, right? It was cloudy. The satellite blocked my telescope, whatever it is. Um, I want to find a way to nonetheless extract the periodic data. Now, this example is pretty fake, right? I mean, I can probably just eyeball this or even mark it out with a pencil, and I know what the answer is. I don't really need anything fancy for this. What about this, though? So here we're looking on the, um, the right-hand side. That's a graph of a particular gene expression during development of a biological organism. Now here we've got a couple of problems. And I'm going to ask you to sort of try to unsee that dotted line. So this is not my data, or I would have really liked to remove that dotted line. That sort of makes it obvious. But try to imagine that you've just sort of got this chunk, and you've got this chunk, and you've got this. 
and you have an idea that you would really like this to be periodic because you have this idea, as do other biologists, that you can explain segmentation and repeated units in biological organisms depending on their developmental gene expression. So you really want this to be periodic. Hopefully it's not just an emotional want. Hopefully you have an intellectual basis. So then you, you apply your lum scargill periodogram and you do in fact find some periodicity, right? And you are actually able to extract this value. So I think this is a really great example of where this can be helpful, where you have to work with irregular time series and you can actually extract very useful information. So here we see the lum scargill, scargill periodogram and we see there's a clear peak, right? We clearly see periodic behavior even though it doesn't even seem like we measured a full period. So um, unlike Fourier transforms where you often need some minimum amount of data and you also need it to be evenly spaced, here we are able to draw conclusions even without that. Um, so this is a fairly cool method. It came out in the 1980s, um, mostly from astronomy, but is now used in many fields. Here are the details. I won't go through these in too much detail, but you'll see that this looks very much like a linear linear fit to sign series, and that's because it is, right? So it's just like a linear regression, except here we are using those sign series. Um, it looks also just like the discrete Fourier transform, right? That is actually just a special case. Um, the difference is that the lohm scargill periodogram is much more flexible. I don't need to have orthogonal basis functions. I don't need to have evenly spaced data, and I don't need to have exactly two to the end points, right? There are some really annoying things about Fourier transform when you're working them with them in a lab that you can escape here. Um, so again, this might all sound quite familiar because it is. Key difference, like I said, the basis functions are much more flexible. They merely need to be independent at the times measured, not even independent over all time. They don't need to be orthogonal, which means you can sort of pick even an irregular series of your sine waves that you want to project onto. Um, your data can be unevenly sampled. That's the whole reason I'm talking about it. And there is no data imputation. This is really important because it means we are not losing data, but we're also not adding data that we have sort of made up in a way. We're not adding any of our own biases. There's also a handy p-value. So if you want a way to sort of compare different fits or different time series, you have more of an objective way to do it, whereas Fourier transform sort of looking at it, deciding how you feel about the noise. And again, you can have any number of points rather than two to the end points. Um, so here's another example of this, seeking cycles in sunspots. So we have sunspot observations since the 1600s. As you can imagine, we sort of look at them better now. Um, I assume we've got a couple of computers keeping an eye on them versus the 1600s. I think it was a couple of guys in Italy and that was probably it. Um, or other countries, I don't know for sure. Um, but the idea is it was sort of irregularly sampled, right? I imagine during the plague or during whatever wars you ha guys had going on over here, the, the quality of the sampling was not so high, right? So nonetheless, we are able to extract a period from this. And you can also see the difference between the loam scargill fit and the discrete Fourier transform. So the discrete Fourier transform is, um, I would say, somewhat misleading. It's much wider than it should be. It also has this second peak that isn't really significant, but if I don't have some sort of objective way to decide, I could be wondering sort of what is that, oh my goodness, can you guys see that? Yes, apologies. Um, I can sort of see that smaller peak and I might wonder if there is something to it, right? And if I don't have a way to deal with my irregular, irregularly spaced time series, what I'm actually looking at here is a peak that I probably got in some way because I had to drop data or add data to accommodate the needs of the Fourier transform versus the loam scargill uses exactly what I have and therefore gives me a more reliable narrow peak. By the way, it is supposed to be at 11 years and that's exactly what I got. Okay, so this is really wonderful, right? I don't have to make up data. Um, I don't have to sort of ignore assumptions of the model to safely use it. And Python already does it. And not only does it do it, but it does it in many different packages. So if you already use SciPy and you don't really want to deal with anything new, Great, you've got it in SciPy. You've also got it in AstroML. And finally, you've got it in Gatspy. I would recommend this one in particular because it has a much faster implementation. So here you can see the, um, the order of the scaling as your sample size grows. And you can see one curve particularly stands out. And that's the Gatsby Loam Scargill Fast, 
What that does is use the intuition, which is actually just a mathematical fact, that you probably have, which is when I compute a couple of signs and the projections, those are not unrelated to the others, right? Especially because I'm not requiring orthogonal functions, there should be some relationship. And so when I use the fast implementation, I do need to use a grid of regularly spaced um, frequencies, which is not my data, it's the functions I'm using to project onto. And if I do that, I can get an order n log n scaling, which is really nice for people who are dealing with a ton of data. Um, you can also roll your own. I think sometimes there is not enough emphasis placed on this. This is a great way to understand how the algorithm works and to also see that some of these algorithms are really not complicated, right? It's a couple of for loops. Um, so this info also is accurate as of June 2015, so if the n log n really matters to you and you love Astro ML or SciPy, I could be wrong since then. Okay. Finally, the great holy grail. Okay, well for finance people, the holy grail is the future, right? You don't actually care what causes the pricing. I think for the rest of us who study anything else, we care less about predicting the future and more about causality, right? I really wanna know what caused what. As um, the authors of this paper I'm gonna talk about state it, learning temporal causal structures between time series is one of the key tools for analyzing time series data, right? Why do I care what happened in the past? Mostly because it explains how things work. Irregularity in sampling violates basic assumptions behind many models for structure learning, right? So I would say all of the great triumphs of modern statistics have, in time series have to do with regularly spaced data, right? We don't really have this holy grail yet for irregularly spaced data. So we're trying to find a sensible way to implement Granger causality for irregular time. How many folks have heard of Granger causality? Okay, so not, not a not just a few, it's a fairly commonly used metric. Basically what Granger causality does is it doesn't get too philosophical. It says that if this thing, if I use X plus everything else I know about the universe, and that is not the same as not using X, then X has some causal relationship. That's the claim, it's a fairly weak claim, very simple to state and understand. What's a good way to see this, right? Like you can actually sort of try to go through this and come up with different ways of determining when they're not equal. What many people do as a shorthand is to use lasso regression. Who is familiar with lasso regression? Probably just about everyone, yeah. So for those who don't know, lasso regression is a way of running a linear regression that also penalizes coefficients. It does it in a way that tends to make coefficients disappear rather than get very small, even though we're penalizing size. So this can be very useful basically for feature selection, which in a way is what Granger causality is like. Also check out, if you don't know, then stats models, this test has already been implemented. Um, I don't know if everyone else has noticed this, but I noticed when I look at Python conference talks for like five years ago versus now, usually five years ago it's someone talking about how they just implemented this, right? Now everything is like, I'm using these awesome tools and they're all ready and they're easy to use. Um, so this is another great example of that. Okay, so what did the authors add in this paper, Bahadori and Liu? They thought, well, how can we look at Granger causality and move it to irregular time series? And they made two important points. First, areas with more regular data, when we predict those, we should care about them more because that is getting us back to those models we understand. So if I have something like this green region with regularly spaced data and preferably more regularly spaced data, I'm gonna weigh that more than this red region. By the way, it's that top time series I'm trying to predict from the bottom. I'm gonna weigh that red region, not so much, right? Because I have this sort of one straight point. I am going to try to predict it, but when I'm predicting that and thinking about the behavior of the whole time series, I'm gonna worry less about that region. The other point they make, oh, the other point they make is cluster data, like this red region on the bottom, that's also not so helpful, right? Lots of points are good if they're spaced apart from each other. Lots of clustered points, right? Predicting this red point versus this red point, it's kind of redundant, right? I mean, unless they're wildly different, which will mostly think, make me think I've got an instrument problem, but unless they're wildly different, they're not gonna tell me much more. So in that way, I actually wanna take this green region again, even with just one point. That individual point is gonna be weighted more than each of these individual points. So thinking that, they rewrite their own version of lasso regression. 
there's a couple of things that are different from lasso regression, right? So we've got this weighting function in the front, V1 and V2. And you'll also see this weird symbol. This is their weird symbol for thinking, how are we going to deal with the irregular time series, right? Because I don't have a grid, so how do I handle that vector multiplication? And here's what they do. So the one weighting factor comes from this first intuition, right? That regularly spaced data should count more. My second weighting factor comes from the other intuition that clustered data is redundant and not helpful. And then finally, to figure out how to do this um, distance relation, what they do is they go with a Gaussian kernel. Um, you can actually try out a bunch of things, see what works for you. But I do just love that Gauss made it onto currency way back in the day. Um, this is how you would implement this. Please don't take photos, because there's actually a couple of errors in the code. I left the working code on my computer in New York and had to retype it, so I promised to post the working code. Um, but mostly, you see here that there's like a couple of for loops. It's actually not that complicated, right? I mean, sometimes we're all sort of reticent to dive into a paper. Do I want to learn a new method when I've already got this awesome SciPy and stats models and pandas? Like, do I need new stuff? Unfortunately, you do need new stuff for irregular time series because it's very much a work in progress. Um, but you can do really cool things. So we see that here. What they did is actually apply their model to a graphical causal Granger model. And they were actually able to figure out which areas were causally related in the Granger sense, not in a stronger sense of the word, to each other. Um, and these are sort of different missing data um, subselections they used to see what that performance looked like. OK, so that's actually a wrap. Um, just to remind you, I did warn you, but this talk was misnamed. Irregular time series are far, far, far from whipped. I would really like to see more work in this area. Um, we really need future work. We're going to have future need for that work. And in the meantime, please do be careful with your data. Um, these are my sources, so if you want the sources, they will be in the slides. And I just want to thank Pi Data. Hi, great talk. Um, I'm a recovering astrophysicist, so I'm far too familiar with the long scargle. Um, <laughs> The one thing I would extend from what you were saying, so one of the problems we traditionally had was it, it never accounted for errors. The classic Lomsk goggle. It has been generalized. And it has been Bayesian generalized if you really want to go the full hog that you actually have some idea of what region you're going into. But the only other extra thing that I would kind of want to add to what you were saying was that, again, with the Lomsk goggle, your missing data can become important in the you will actually, if you've got periodic missing data cycles, you'll see that in your Lomsk goggle result, obviously. But it'll also alias with other signals. So you still have to be careful with these things. But it is definitely useful when you don't have regular space stuff. Any more questions? Um, your, your talk said all the lots of good stuff about Lomsk goggle. Someone mentioned that there was error management that wasn't necessarily as ideas. Is there anything else we should be worried about? Uh, is it a lot more expensive computationally than uh, Fourier, for instance? Can you say that last part again? Is it a lot more expensive? For, what is the things that we should worry about before trying to implement it on not so regular data? So to me, as, a, as someone more computer science oriented, what I'm most concerned about is that order n squared implementation as far as mm. expense. Is, is that what you meant? Like, mm. yeah. So. There is this order n log n implementation now that works very well. I would stick with that um, as far as I know. But I would be curious as to your um, perspective. I don't believe that introduces new kinds of errors to worry about, just the usual provisos. And you do have to use those regularly um, spaced basis functions. You can't use anything. OK, if there are no more questions, please thank Carnil, Aline Nelson. Thank you.